This is a brief video about reorganizing our government, a, a reorganization plan to make it much more efficient and effective. As I've argued before in another video, our current constitution does not do a good job. It violates many of the principles of good government, which include majority rule, one person, one vote, representative government, competitive elections, and national self-determination. This proposed constitution will fix these flaws and restore a level of functionality to our government, which is currently beset by gridlock, partisanship, much corruption, much legalized corruption. It's not perfect, but the model I'm going to propose I think is much, much better. So I say keep the Bill of Rights and expand it with a right of privacy. So we're keeping the good parts of our of our government, but fixing the flaws. The big, 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 big flaw in our current arrangement is that citizens are excluded from government. And that's a huge, it underlies so many of the other problems in government. Basically, this is the primary structure of government. We have the House of Representatives with congresspersons elected every two years, the senators, elected two from each state. The Supreme Court justices are, are nine and they serve for life. And the president is voted for every four years by the people. Okay, what are some of the problems with this system? We're missing something down here. We're missing state governments. They're generally not in the federal government. And we're missing citizens. Citizens are pretty much aloof from government. We're disconnected. We're not in the equation. This is a giant problem. But if we look at just the House and the Senate, the House is proportional by population. The Senate is proportional by state. So every state has two, rep two senators, and every state has different numbers of representatives in the House depending on how large its population is. The problem being with the Senate is that huge states such as California, New York, or Texas have the same number of senators, only two each, as rural states like Wyoming or Alaska or Idaho. So what happens is huge populous states like California and New York are underrepresented in the Congress. Who makes Domestic policy, well, it's not just the Congress, but it's also the Supreme Court and the President. All of these branches of government make domestic policy. The Senate and the House obviously make legislation, but the Supreme Court, it can review or the laws made by the Senate and the House and can nullify them. So the Supreme Court is really, in this model, another legislative body. These are super legislators who can look at these laws and say, nope, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to change it. Further, the president also can make laws by being in charge of all these executive agencies, the Department of H Housing. You have one function divided up between these different branches of government and it provides for a lot of conflict. It doesn't provide for much unity of effort. Let me look at one other flaw with this arrangement. Who makes foreign policy? All these branches, the Congress, the presidency, all have a role in foreign policy. The Senate has a role of ratifying treaties. The House has the role of declaring war. The president has the most foreign policy authority. So if you have the foreign policy function split up among different power centers and maybe in 1787 that was a good arrangement because the chief concern among the framers was to prevent tyranny and by dividing power this way over foreign policy yes you do prevent tyranny the problem is in today's world it doesn't make much sense because now if there's a problem with foreign policy every different branch can point to the others the president can say well it's the house's fault the House can say, no, it's the President's fault. 
the, the president can say, no, the Senate shouldn't have ratified this treaty. They can all point fingers at each other. There's no one branch in control. Further, the president is popularly elected, and he or she has great authority over foreign policy. The problem is the president has three basic responsibilities, which is essentially too much responsibility for one person. He or she is in charge of foreign policy. He or she is the head of a political party. And he or she is in charge of the domestic government. How can you find one person to do all three? Further, there's no requirement that the president have any diplomatic or military experience. The last four or five presidents, very few have had this kind of experience. So we, the public, do not understand foreign policy. We're not qualified to judge who's qualified to, to run foreign policy. We're thinking about our pocketbooks. Further, but he or she is learning on the job often. So what happens is the foreign policy of the country can change every eight years, sometimes after four. If you're a foreign country and, you want, and the President of the United States makes a commitment, but you know that he or she is going to be out of office in four years or eight years, how can you count on that promise? Because the next president might say, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do something totally different. How do we solve these problems? We need a State Department. We need one branch of government with total control over foreign policy. One branch of government which has the power to enact decisions to make long-term policies that the nation can stick with over time. So I'm going to propose a structure like this. We have advisors. These are hundred in number, highly paid. They're, they're chosen by the Senate when they're young, they're under 40 typically, and they stay in the State Department for long periods of time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. There's a hundred of them, they develop experience, they become knowledgeable about the world, they see trends forming and patterns happening. It is like de Tocqueville said, it's a wise man who never dies. You don't have this problem like an ADD like foreign policy with every four to eight years the policy changes. They can make policies that allies can count on. So the advisors will choose a head of state. The advantage with this arrangement is that if a head of state becomes corrupt or incompetent, he or she can be replaced quickly. The advisor can say, sorry, we're going to switch you out and put in a new head of state. With the current system, with the president running foreign policy, if the president is incompetent, it's a huge problem getting rid of him or her. Now, the head of state's job will be to run the military, to meet with ambassadors, espionage, immigration policy. All of these variables that deal with foreign policy will be in this department and will be accountable, with a couple of exceptions. The State Department will not have charge over the budget. The head of state cannot declare war. That will be the duty of the House of Representatives. In the current system, the House is supposed to be the branch of government that declares war, but the president has so much authority. In the past, there have been several wars that are undeclared. The Most Western-style nations have two different people to occupy the two different roles. This is what we should do. Having the president do all of these roles is a mistake. With the State Department having this much power, it would solve foreign policy, but it makes a risk of tyranny. So what we need to do is make the domestic federal government stronger, restore citizens to the domestic government. Let me just say a word about citizens here. Right now, we are not citizens. We have passports, we can live and work here, we have certain rights, which is good. We as people do not participate in government. Every four years, about half of us bother to vote, but most of us do not know who our representatives are. This is a problem. We need to be real citizens. This is important. We have to meet with our representatives regularly 
for at least for an hour, a couple of times a year. We need to be able to ask them questions to know what our representatives are doing and they, representatives or their proxy need to ask us questions. What do we want? What do we think? Further, citizenship means that we have a duty to other citizens to protect each other if government becomes abusive. Rebuilding the domestic side of the federal government is to reinsert state governments into the federal government. We can restore them by turning their power to choose two senators. Here the Senate and the citizens will choose House of Representatives. To solve the problem of disproportionate funds being steered to rural states, the Senate will no longer have authority over the budget. The House will have term limits. They're elected for a two-year term. So the two years in the House, then two years out. There'll be 435 representatives, like it is now. There will be no incumbents running for office. Right now we have a two-party system. We can switch to a multi-party system. In a multi-party system, abolishing the winner-take-all rule and the first-past-the-post rule. Instead of voting for a candidate, voters will vote for a party. So if party X gets 51% of the votes, then party X will get 51% of the seats. Party Y, if it has 30% of the votes, will get 30% of the seats. Citizens will choose representatives. State governments will choose senators. There will be 100 senators, 435 representatives. This branch of government will be in charge of the budget will have the power to declare war. The Senate will be people that the state governments trust. And the House, at the beginning of every two-year term, representatives choosing one senator to be the president. And he or she will run the administration. The president will choose from among the Senate to run the different departments, let's say the Department of the Interior. A benefit with the structure is a unified government that's all pretty much on the same page. It's refreshed every two years with a new vote, and yet it's internal, consistent. The Senate brings six-year terms of experience, people that are trusted by the state governments. The House brings the will of the people expressed here. When the House chooses a president, they know that they're going to choose somebody with experience because they've been in the Senate. So it's a president, and they're going to run domestic policy. This branch controls the people in it. The president can fire the head of state, or the Senate can fire particular advisors. But this branch of government, the domestic government, cannot control the policies of, the, of this branch of government. The domestic government will be the one that we relate to as people. We are well qualified to choose our representatives because we know what we want. We'll vote on pocketbook issues. By choosing a senator to be the president, we, we can trust that the president will have experience. It won't be somebody who's learning on the job. This branch of government will monitor the state, the state Department. The Supreme Court will no longer have the power of judicial review, will not be super legislators. One other thing I'd like to point out here. Put the president in charge of the National Guard. How the state controls the national military. You have two spheres of influence. You have the domestic military and you have the national military. It's a way to divide the military to pre prevent tyranny. A representative will get in office and he or she will be there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They're stuck there because they like the money, they're well paid, they've rigged the rules so they get reelected again and again and again. They don't have to listen to the constituents because the elections aren't competitive. Same thing with senators. We have senators in office for extended periods of time. And to some extent, that's good. They get experience. In my model, uh, they will stay in office hopefully long times. But there's not much of a flow of offices. You can have a president come out of nowhere. You can have a president with no experience, a reality TV star. Anybody who has money can become president without having run the, the run of offices. The new system will encourage politicians to get experience in many different offices so that they learn government from different points of view. An entry point might be in their state government as a as state senator or state representative. They might then run for a house seat. They're two years in the house, two years out. 
Maybe they can become a senator, they can become a president. Officials will have the chance to work in many different capacities, all of the time getting more and more experience. The idea of a federal arrangement, each state decides for its own, and that means that for us citizens, there are 50 separate states competing to attract us to move to their state, looking to have the best business regulatory framework. This gives us huge freedom. If we're dissatisfied with our situation, we can move to a state which regulates better and we don't have to change countries. The individual state governments can learn from each other. They can say, oh, Rhode Island's regulating better than New Jersey, so New Jersey can copy the Rhode Island rule. This is the beauty of the federal arrangement. Overall, this is one structure. There are probably other ways to reorganize government, but this structure would work well for the 21st century America. This is basically a brief outline of my proposed constitution. It's more elaborated, more in-depth in my book, Common Sense 2. It's on Amazon or Kindle. Thank you for listening.